Bowman, Mike Beer. The DRF race of the day for Thursday, February the 23rd, race number eight at Gulfstream Park, seven eighths of a mile on the dirt. It's a first level allowance restricted to Florida breads, and it's for three year olds. Let's take a look at this field. Trainer Todd Pletcher, who else? As the morning line favorite, the number eight, Rudder's Men, who took on first-level allowance foes last time out of the open variety in a race that produced a next-out winner of a Kentucky Derby prep. The runner-up and his stablemate Litigate would go on to take the Sam F. Davis. Yeah, Rudder's Men. Um, I guess he was in a, a pretty tough field last time, Dan, as the favorite. He did not run that well in that race. His debut, though, last October at uh, Aqueduct ran pretty well that day. He's not the only horse in this race getting some significant class relief, and others are at better prices. We'll throw up the Timeform U.S. Pace Projector before discussing those horses to see how this race might be run. Now, the six bring the band home is a bit of a question mark for trainer Mark Cassie because we haven't seen him since he graduated at Saratoga way back in July, but he figures to show fresh speed. The question is, will he be ready off such a long layoff, and will he be ready to go seven, which can be a demanding distance for for a first off the bench horse? Yeah, both major, major questions. This horse actually looked really good as a two-year-old. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see how he comes back. And I guess it will also be interesting, Dan, to see how aggressive they get with him here in his first off the layoff going seven. He could certainly make the lead if he uh, breaks the gate well and they want it. Rudder's men the eight. Uh, to me, he's a pretty fast horse and I'm, I'd be surprised if Irab is gonna be rating him in here. Rudder's men has speed and roll on Big Joe has also shown high early speed in his two starts this form cycle. We'll begin with a horse that could be coming from off of the pace. That's the number one Cajun Dream, who was a debut winner at Gulfstream going three quarters of a mile and then ran in the open Limehouse stakes last time out. And I think a couple of things going against him in the Limehouse. A, they might have just been a little bit too aggressive from a class standpoint, running against the likes of Super Chow, who would come back to run second second in the grade three swell with an 87 buyer. B, that race was really dominated up front and he had the worst of it trying to come from the back. Didn't do much running. He did not. Um, I'm willing to give him a pass uh, for the Limehouse, Dan. Um, as poorly as he ran that day, I don't think you're really supposed to hold it against him. Probably the right thing to do is to judge him off of his debut. And, um, you know, you can make your own decisions about that. I thought he ran fine in there. Um, it's, it, to me, it wasn't the kind of performance that, uh, to me, made him too interesting in this race. But I guess he ran fine that day. I just kind of feel like he beat a bad field. He'll receive Lasix for the first time as he drops back in with Florida bred only competition. The number two is Naruto, who graduated in this race, his third lifetime start, a Florida bred maiden special going three quarters of a mile, just showed speed down towards the inside and kept right on rolling along, had a pretty easy pace up front that day. And one of the issues with Naruto is this race was when mid-November, he was listed as a vet scratch on January the 6th, and it's taken him over a month to get back in the entries yeah i mean he's just he hasn't he's taking steps forward from race to race though so that that's a positive i suppose dan but he hasn't run a fast race yet um i guess he was fine breaking his maiden last time this is a really really tough spot for him to step up into the number three is Free Soul. Free Soul's only lifetime victory came on turf, but he's run well on dirt against the likes of Two Phils, who's done some good things on the Triple Crown Trail at the fairgrounds this winter. His most recent start came in an off-turf race, a sloppy track in the Laurel Futurity, and he pushed the pace before tiring. A, probably overmatched, might not have liked the slop. The third place finishers come back to do some good things against first level allowance competition, buyers of 77 and 76. Yeah, I guess you could say he's dirtied up by the two stakes in his last two starts. He did break his maiden on a different surface, though, um, going longer. I mean, his dirt form leading up to that, it was okay, Dad. He was in against a couple of these horses in his second career start, and he was just no match for them. This, is, uh, this race is way tougher than that one. Like the one and the two, the three free soul will receive Lasix for the first time on Thursday. That was the angle that helped the four roll on Big Joe uh, propel himself to a maiden victory against Open Company. This is a $50,000 maiden optional claimer. And as you can see, Roll on Big Joe just ran these horses off their feet. He's also drifting out to visit some fans who are looking some, for some autographs and pets and maybe to feed him some carrots here at about the 16th pole. How good could this field have been if he was running sideways in the stretch? 
Yeah, he drifted out very badly there, but he did go uh, a pretty fast pace in here, as you mentioned, to run these horses right out of the race there, Dan. And it's not like it's the only, you know, solid figure that he's earned in his career. Usually when you see horses win by that kind of a margin, it has a lot to do uh, with the competition they were facing. And I think if you go into your formulator PPs and uh, pull up the chart of that race and sort of take that race apart, you will see that. He was beating a pretty bad field that day. Um, he does have some other races that give him a chance in here, though. I, I guess he could win here, Dan. I won't argue with the with the six to one morning line price. I wonder if he'll actually get that. But it was his first race with Lasix, his first race in from the West Coast, and he appears to have that Southern California speed. The five is Diamond Cool, who was third in a first level allowance last time out. We're going to take a look at that race for trainer Pat Biancone. Irad Ortiz rode this day. His brother Jose will pilot Diamond Cool on Thursday. And as you see, Diamond Cool is right up close to the pace here as the favorite. He had a huge look at it turning into the stretch, but this pace setter keeps on going. Yeah, he had a great trip in this race, and he just can't really make a race of it uh, through the stretch here with the horse that's on the lead. He does get nailed for second right on the wire. I thought it was kind of a modest performance, Dan, considering the trip that he got in the race. Um, he did break his maiden going this seven furlongs. Two starts back, though, against Florida Breds. Um, that was another one of those races, though, Dan, where he made the lead. They didn't even have to send him. The pace wasn't fast. And then once he took over or kicked away from them coming into the stretch, just nobody ran behind them. It, it, to me, it makes it pretty hard to judge how good this horse is. Bring the band home. The number six shipped up from Gulfstream to Saratoga for this maiden win on July the 23rd against maiden special weights. He broke very sharp in this race and he settled off of a, a long shot. The number six who would get very tired in this race and finish uh, pretty far behind. I like the way bring the band home, put that horse away. And then he is pretty game to Fend off next out winner, Powerful, who is now a stakes winner. The third place horse is now graded stakes placed. The fourth place horse would come back to hit the board with an 80 buyer. After this race, he was working in company with Wonder Wheel as she was preparing for the spin away the final day of the week. But then he disappeared. He's returning with Lasix. I'm also not sure what to think about returning with Blinkers. Uh, yeah, I don't like that either. Um, you mentioned that yeah, he, he was working with Wonder Wheel there before they stopped on him. And Wonder Wheel actually blew him away in that, in that workout. Um, I could go either way on this horse, Dan, and he's five to one on the morning line. So I don't feel like, you know, this is a, a position to take a big stand against him if he's that kind of price, because he showed, I thought some real talent as a two-year-old. He was also, I remember seeing him at Saratoga, really big, good looking horse. Like he maybe was a little bit of a head ahead of some of the other two-year-olds uh, at that time. I wonder if they've caught up to him since then. I don't love the idea of taking him going seven, uh, back off of a long layoff like this, but I do think he has some talent. Now, the number seven, Knox, would really appreciate it if our friends at Timeform US, they're right. And that pace projector is a red bar situation. It plays out that way on the track and a fast pace helps these horses come back to him late because he doesn't have a ton of early speed. He was a closing third, two starts back. Uh, uh, in a stakes race at Gulfstream going two turns. Last time out in the inaugural, Mike, again, it was a race at Tampa Bay. He faced three next out winners and didn't get the setup. Yeah, he didn't. You're right about that. The, the winner wired that field. Um, this horse was just a little bit too far away and probably overmatched as well, Dan. I mean, he broke his maiden first time out and he's been in stakes since then and didn't run terrible in the first two of those. I guess the you know, the big question mark is that it, when he did win sprinting on debut, it was a sloppy track. Um, but I thought he ran pretty well in there. And I like that he's getting this class relief really, finally. Morning line favorite is the eight rudders men who graduated at this seven eighths of a mile distance up in New York for Todd Pletcher showed high speed that day. Todd ran him in a first level allowance against Lydigate, who ran second, came back, won the Sam F. Davis, uh, one of two next out winners to emerge from that one turn mile heat. Pretty solid class drop here. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I, listen, he as disappointing as he was last time, and I thought he was pretty disappointing after making the lead. Um, it was going a mile. It was off of a little bit of a layoff. It was also a pretty good field that he was facing there. And this is outside of the Cassie horse coming back off the layoff. This is, you know, very, very significant class relief for this horse. He was really good breaking his maiden first time out uh, at, at Aqueduct. And that was a fast pace. He had that field all strung out behind him. And he just kept going through the stretch. 
the nine big save is going to be making a surface switch moving from the tapita to the dirt he is a winner on dirt going seven eighths at gulfstream that in early october last time out on the uh synthetic going two turns again it was a race that was won in gate to wire fashion he tried to come from out of it yeah, and he's going to try to come from out of it again here, and maybe he will have, you know, a, a pretty big pace in front of him that will allow him to come running at the end and maybe, you know, pick up a piece of this thing. He's got to obviously get a lot faster. He has not run a fast race yet, but he did win. Uh, he did break his maiden second time out going this distance from off the pace. And the horse that did wire him last time out came back to run a good third in the Sam F. Davis behind Litigate with a 72 buyer. Hard to handle is the number 10. Now, hard to handle is going to be making his second start of the year for trainer David Fox. And you can just draw a line through his last race because he ran against arguably one of the best three-year-olds in the country in Tappet Trice. That was a race where this horse showed some good speed in the early portion, pressing the pace down towards the inside. But the pace heated up on the back stretch into the turn and he was outpaced i thought all in all it was a decent performance against better competition i'm very surprised he's 20 to 1 on the morning line uh, i don't disagree with any of that dan um and if nothing else i know it was only a two-month layup that could have been a pretty good tightener last time in a race where he just really didn't have that much of a chance but he did match his career top buyer the, the figure that he earned breaking his maiden going this distance you know way back in september so he could easily take a step forward here the number 11 is Apocalypso, who has experience against stakes competition. He was third going this distance in one of the divisions of the Florida Stallion Series as a two-year-old. In his last two races, maybe he can make the argument he's a little bit dirtied up. He showed speed in a two-turn race, and maybe two turns isn't going to be his game. And last time out, he ran in the inaugural, and again, that was a race dominated by Super Chow up front. Three next out winners. He had no pace to run at. Could be a different situation for a horse that seemingly has the right running style and a lot of upside for Sappy Joseph. Yeah, those things are true. I mean, I guess he could close into this race, Dan, if it sets up for him. Um, and we'll see if he can, you know, sort of improve a little bit because he is going to have to improve to contend here with Lasix and Blinkers going on. Three straight stakes races since he broke his maiden. But with Bring the Band Home and Rudder's Men in this race, it doesn't really feel like class relief for him. English Bob is going to complete this field in number 12. This horse returns to Florida bred only competition after finishing seventh in that uh, allowance race that we showed you early on that featured Diamond Cool. Now, he pressed the winner that day and tired. I really couldn't find much of an excuse. Maybe this class drop helps, but there are others dropping in class in seemingly better form. Yeah, it's, this is a tougher spot than the last one, Dan. Um, and he just didn't run well in that race. He did, you know, run pretty well when he won his career debut at a absolutely huge price um, that day. But I, I just don't feel like if he runs another race like that, he gets anything in here. Before we get to our top selections, please click the subscribe button on the Daily Racing Form YouTube channel for the latest DRF videos. Top pick time for our Thursday race of the day. We're going seven eighths of a mile. Rudders men from the Todd Pletcher barn in with Florida breads, Mike, either's going to the front or is gonna be right off of it when the real running starts. Yeah, I just like this spot for him, Dan. Um, I He was pretty, I was pretty disappointed in his last race, but I remember really liking his debut last year. I'm gonna give him the chance to rebound in here just because bring the band home. I, I think he's a good horse. I think he's got too many questions to answer here. He does have questions to answer. I think five to one is a fair price if I get it. And if I do, I will play the six, bring the band home. I like the way he dug down deep to win that race at Saratoga. We'll see how Mark Cassie, who's had a pretty solid meet at Gulfstream, does off the bench. Six, four, five, two for me. Mike's going rudders men in this pretty solid three-year-old state bread allowance race. Your DRF race of the day for Thursday. Good luck.